The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Retinal Disease in the ED, See Me Now, a primer for emergency physicians on the recognition and differential diagnosis of retinal vein occlusions. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash FHQ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Robert Hughes. I'm an emergency medicine physician up in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm the Health Systems Director of Operations and Logistics, and I'm an assistant professor within the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. Joining me today to talk about retinal disease in the emergency department is Dr. Christina Wang. She's a professor of ophthalmology and fellowship program director of vitreo retinal disease and surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. So we have three specific goals today. We're gonna to talk about augmenting our ability to recognize signs and symptoms of retinal vein occlusion. A little bit broader than that, we're gonna actually focus on how to really do a good history and physical examination in order to take what is otherwise a really broad differential with acute vision loss in the emergency department and distill it down to a specific clinical entity that we'll dive into a little deeper today. We're going to also equip you with skills to differentially diagnose RVO from other retinal conditions, again, leaning into a really good history and physical exam in order to be able to diagnose these things in a timely manner. We're also going to approve your ability to coordinate with other members of our healthcare team and provide continuity of care with the patient with RVO after discharge from the ED. And we're going to get some really special insight from our ophthalmology colleagues with exactly how we're going to know how to diagnose this, what the ultimate treatment options are, what our time frame follow-up components are, and we'll dive into this more. So let's get started here by talking about managing acute vision loss in the emergency department. So this is hard. It can be really challenging to diagnose acute vision loss in the ED, and mainly that's because there are so many etiologies of this and it generates a massive differential diagnosis. So the question before us is, how do we take this broad differential for a patient with acute vision loss and distill it down into a specific clinical entity that we can act on, treat, get appropriate follow-up? And key to that is going to be early recognition, referral, and treatments that are critical to preserving the patient's vision and ultimately improving their outcomes, because a lot of these are very time-sensitive pathologies. So first, we're going to talk about obtaining a history, which I think is one of the most important things in our tool bag as we assess a patient with any clinical entity, but specifically with eye complaints primarily. So first, we need to really get our hands around a description of the issue. We need to understand a couple different components of things. Is it one eye or is it both eyes? Is it painful or painless? Was it whole field or partial field vision loss? Was it more of a blurring or was it a complete cutout of vision? How about the pain quality and character or is it painless completely? We need to talk about timing. Was it sudden or gradual and onset? Was it temporary or constant? Do we have stuttering symptoms associated with this? Was it instantaneous or was it slowly progressive? And what was our time frame with which it progressed over? The other thing to consider, and we'll talk about this more, is identifying if this is an isolated eye issue or if this is syndromic, because we really need to consider things like posterior circulation insults that can lead to vision disturbance that can sometimes manifest as what is perceived to be an isolated eye issue, but in fact is a cerebral issue that we have to address separately. So as we're talking about performing a detailed eye exam, there's a lot of components that go into this. There is the visual acuity, there's a pupil exam, we need to do extraocular movements and alignment of the eyes, check in interocular pressure, we need to do confrontational visual fields, a really solid external exam, a slit lamp exam, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, and an attempt at fundoscopy. And I know we're all kind of laughing looking at fundoscopy in the same way that we look at getting a really good auscultation of heart and lung sounds in the ED as it's busy and bells are ringing all around you. But we have some tips of the trade here that are going to help you do this better at the bedside. I, however, like to simplify all of the content on the past slide into the following. I like to think about my eye exam as before the eye, for the eye, and beyond the eye. So when I talk about for the eye, I talk about ocular vital signs. What's the visual acuity? What's the ocular pressure? Things that I want my team to be able to assess or I will assess dynamically in order to identify the health of the eye in real time. 
Then I think about what I'm doing for the eye, my testing of the extraocular motions and visual fields, that external exam and slit lamp and fundoscopy. Then I think about before the eye, because we had talked about syndromic possibilities cropping up, causing this vision loss that might actually be more of a systemic problem. So we need to do a good neuro exam. We need an oral pharyngeal and an ear exam. We need to look at the skin and look for lesions. Does a person have maybe a uh, reactivation of herpes zoster and they have more of a syndromic event here? These are all really important components to perform a solid history. But again, it's before the eye, it's for the eye, and it's beyond the eye. Let's take a brief second to talk about a slit lamp. I know the woods lamp. I've used the woods lamp. I like the woods lamp, but I would argue that we should make a good attempt at getting really good at doing a solid slit lamp exam at the bedside because of the amount of information we can glean from it. Now, there's a lot of knobs on a slit lamp and they're all a little bit different, different enough that it could be confusing when you first show up to a department and you're brand new and you're trying to figure your way around. And so I simplify this into PPAA. First, figure out how to turn it on. And I know that sounds really silly, but the last thing you want to do is sit in front of a patient and then sort of flounder around for where the power button is. The next, and I would argue maybe the most important, is patient position. This is also your comfort, but the patient's chin not only has to be on the chin rest, but their forehead has to be touching that white band in order to get appropriate depth from the ocular field so that you could do a good assessment. Pupils aligned with that black line just to the upper left of the two. Next, we wanna aim the light. Literally, just aim the light, get yourself into a good position, get yourself in a good depth of field, and then you wanna adjust your beam. So power, position, aim, and adjust. This is gonna allow you to do a really solid examination. We're gonna be able to look at the lids and lashes on an external exam, checking out the periorbital tissues and glands. We're gonna evert the lids because we wanna make sure there's not foreign bodies, particularly with longitudinal scraping, corneal abrasions that might indicate a retained foreign body. Check out the conjunctiva and sclera, looking for injection or hemorrhage or discharge. Looking at the cornea for abrasions, perforations, a foreign body like we mentioned. Checking out the anterior chamber, looking for cell and flare, a hyphema or a hypopian, afferent defects on the pupils, and checking out the iris in the lens. As we had talked about before, the history and the physical exam are the crux of what drives our ability to narrow down a differential diagnosis. And we're here talking about central retinal vein occlusion and what we're going to do about that. But all of this combines to allow you to take this very broad differential and narrow it down to an appropriate diagnosis. So with that, we need to talk about what we need to consider for follow-up. And we have a couple of clinical entities here that we broke down into follow-up like ASAP, follow-up pretty quickly, and then follow-up within 24 to 48 hours. And you can see the smattering of differentials there. Central retinal artery occlusion, glaucoma, giant cell arteritis are pretty immediate potential loss of vision pathologies that need to be seen to be evaluated and treated immediately, AKA before you even transfer. Issues that require more emergent and same-day follow-up, chemical burns, endophthalmitis, and infectious keratitis, an open globe, which you could probably bridge between those top two categories, and then the things that are pretty quick follow-up within 24 to 48 hours, which includes our central retinal vein occlusion that we'll talk more about today, optic neuritis, uveitis, and a vitreous hemorrhage. So a 56-year-old male walks into our emergency department, sudden, painless loss of vision in the right eye. Couple key history components that we had talked about before. The patient woke up in the morning, unilateral, painless, in that right eye. The visual field is blurry. It's not a complete blackening of the vision. You can see that the right eye there is 2400, left eye 2025, and both together 2200. The patient denies any previous episodes of vision loss. No history of corrective lenses, no ocular surgeries, trauma, or exposure to chemicals, denying any additional symptoms, again, beyond the patient, like headache or slurred speech or motor or sensory deficits. We do a really good history on the patient. We find out that they have a history of hypertension and diabetes. The patient is on dulagotide and they're on lisinopril. Their hypertension is not greatly controlled. You're able to do a record review and find out that their systolic is relatively consistently between 130 and 165. And there are your initial vitals, a little hypertensive, but otherwise pretty unremarkable. So Christina, you know, as I look at uh, George's condition here, 
and I start looking at his presentation, we only have history parameters here, and I can already start to mentally narrow this down to certain types of pathology. What are the things that are starting to crop up in your mind as a specialist in this field, looking at this history with what could potentially be causing his vision loss? That's right. Yeah, Bobby, exactly. So, you know, the first thing that really strikes me is you got to look at the age, and that's usually the first thing we say when we're presenting a patient. So 56-year-old automatically puts me into a frame of mind for certain conditions. And of course, RVO is one of those conditions. The fact that it's unilateral, the fact that it's painless, and in one eye and he woke up with it is also kind of tailoring my thought in that direction. But remember, I think it's one thing that's really interesting to point out when you were going excellent differential earlier in the slide deck is that so don't completely rule out certain things, even if they might not fit the clinical picture, because there can always be exceptions. But someone who's of 2400 with unilateral painless vision loss you've got to be thinking about things like retinal vein occlusion and even artery occlusion as well which i know we're going to talk about a little bit later what also draws my attention are his number of cardiovascular risk factors he's a diabetic he's not only hypertensive but even on medications which i'm assuming he is taking his hypertension is not well controlled i mean a systolic that goes up to 165 the fact that he's checking in at 140 today that makes me concerned. And certainly that is one of the leading risk factors for retinal vein occlusion. You know, what I love that you brought up is the fact that even though we have a pretty good history about a monocular vision loss and the patient tells us certain components, it's one of those things that you want to trust but verify because there could be a time where a patient says, oh, it's my right eye. But then when I cover the right eye, they turn out to have a left eye deficit as well. And it turns out to be a hemianopsia or something like that. And I think it's really good to point out that these folks have syndromic issues sometimes that mask as primary ophthalmologic complaints. And it is really important that we as emergency medicine physicians don't toss this out immediately. This history is re reassuring that it's piping us in a certain direction, but I think we got more to do, right? Probably a physical exam and getting some more data points, I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. And I think this really ties in nicely. You know, the history really is the key to unlocking the diagnosis, but tying it in with a very strong preliminary ophthalmic vital sign check, as well as a slit lamp examination, dilated fundoscopic examination is really going to key you in and, and lead you to the answer here. You're right. I think we need some more data. You know, briefly, while we're on this slide here, and we're talking about just isolated history parameters, any additional history or clarification of certain bits of the history that you think would help me as the EM physician sitting with George could like help me move along the clinical pathway here? Yeah, it's a great question. I would only suggest three more things. I think this is a very thorough history here, but smoking is always something important to ask about because retinal vein occlusion can also overlap with some components of diabetic retinopathy, which is one of the, the most common ophthalmic conditions, especially today in the global epidemic of diabetes that we find ourselves in. So that's something I would ask, especially since this person is diabetic. I think a nice way of asking about ophthalmic history, which patients sometimes forget to tell you about, is to ask if they're on any eye drops. And then they might mention, oh, right, I'm taking this drop for eye pressure. And then you find out they have glaucoma, even though they didn't mention to you that you had glaucoma. So I see that it was negative for corrective lenses or a history of ocular surgery or trauma, but maybe specifically asking about the most common retinal diseases like macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma is really helpful just to make sure that the patient isn't forgetting to tell you something. It is such a good point because people will give a history based off the type of questions we ask for. And sometimes we can be overly specific in the way that we ask and we have to broaden our net to make sure that we get all the relevant information. Yeah, exactly. All well right. Said. With that, we're going to move on here. And we're going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Wang here because we're going to talk about specifically when to suspect this particular pathology, a retinal vein occlusion. We're gonna talk about the timely recognition and differential diagnoses in the ED in a little bit more detail. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wang. Thanks, Dr. Hughes, for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna lead things into the ophthalmic side of RVO. Again, taking that history is so, so important, but let's dive in a little bit deeper into what this disease actually entails. And I'll even give you a little glimpse of the cutting edge treatments that we're using for RVO and its complications a little bit later in the deck. So retinal vein occlusion is something that a lot of people have never heard of, but believe it or not, it's the second most common retinal vascular disease. A lot of people know about diabetic retinopathy, they know about macular degeneration, but RVO is something that you should always keep in mind. 
There's a lot of theories actually with regards to its etiology, but essentially you can think of it as a stopping up, kind of like I always tell my patients, it's sort of like if your drain in your bathtub stopped up and the water begins to overflow over the bathtub. Similar analogy here. So it's a blockage or compression of a retinal vein in the eye by an adjacent artery. And in fact, what happens if you look in the back of the eye, and just to give, I know everyone is coming from different levels and backgrounds of ophthalmology. So just a very brief recap, you know, the retina is the layer lining the back of the eye and its blood supply comes from the carotid arteries, which branch off into the ophthalmic arteries, which then branch off into the central retinal artery. And there's also a corresponding central retinal vein. That's gonna be our focus in today. But that feeds really the back layer of the eye and the arteries actually run over the veins. And so for a number of different reasons, if that artery somehow is blocking the drainage of the vein, you end up getting this retinal vein occlusion. And you'll see in some of the pictures that I'll show you a little bit later, you end up getting hemorrhages that basically spill out of these vessels um, just, just from true hydrostatic pressure. There's two different categories that you can divide up a retinal vein occlusion into. The first is a BRVO or a branch retinal vein occlusion. And the second is a CRVO, which is more serious. That's a central retinal vein occlusion. And so really to define that really just goes back to whether it's the central retinal vein coming out of that um, ophthalmic vein that is blocked up or if it's one of the secondary or tertiary or quad, you know, quad branches of that. The more common of the two is BRVO, which accounts for about 70 to 80% of RVO cases, but CRVO is not that uncommon. And it's probably actually, it seems higher to a lot of my emergency medicine colleagues because oftentimes those patients have a much more noticeable visual acuity change because it is the central retinal artery that's involved. And that accounts for about two, 20 to 30% of all RVO cases. Finally, there's one other branch that oftentimes falls into the category of BRVO, and that's called a hemiretinal vein occlusion. This is a really striking image. Once you see it, you'll never forget it because nothing quite looks like it, but you'll see hemorrhages exactly along the horizontal meridian of the retina. So it'll either be the superior or the inferior half of the retina with a lot of different hemorrhages. Sometimes we call it a blood and thunder appearance. I'll show you that in the next slide. But that is a, a very rare subtype of RVO that oftentimes is classified as a branch retinal vein occlusion. So again, I mentioned already that RVO is just second to diabetic retinopathy when it comes to retinal vascular disease. It is something that happens quite often, affecting about 28 million people globally. And if you look at the age and sex standardized prevalence, it's about 7.7 .7 per 1,000 people for any type of RVO. And you can see the breakdown of 6.4 per 1,000 for BRVO, 1.3 per 1,000 for CRVO. The number one risk factor for RVO is age. So the older a patient is, when they get to their 60s, 70s, and 80s, the more likely they are to have experienced this at some point. And in fact, one of the papers has estimated that the prevalence is about 5% in patients who are 80 years and older. What about the risk factors? We talked already about the fact that older age is a risk factor. What do we mean by older age? Uh, that becomes higher and higher as I get older myself, but generally we say about 50 or 55. If you see an RVO in someone younger than 50 or 55, red flags should be raised. It absolutely can happen, but you should be starting to think about other systemic etiologies that are contributing to that presentation because generally this is a, a more elderly patient disease. The second most common risk factor that you have to note is so common in our patients today, right? Cardiovascular risk factors, those metabolic triads, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes mellitus. So if a patient has any or all of those, really, you should be thinking about this diagnosis as well. And then the third one I'm going to point out from that list on the left is really any sort of hypercoagulability. And this can be anything from factor V Leiden, for example, or uh, someone who's taking birth control, right? Those can make you more hypercoagulable or abnormal platelet function. So those are things that you should also keep in the back of your mind. And finally, I lumped smoking in with cardiovascular risk factors. And when Dr. Hughes was presenting that case of George, you noticed that I mentioned smoking as something that we should really take note of because that is one of the you know, few modifiable risk factors that we can actually help a patient sort of steer and change their prognosis. Remember that once a patient has an RVO, it can always happen again to that same eye. It can also happen to the contralateral eye. So we want to be thinking about things that we can do to intervene and minimize their future risk.
Finally, the last thing I'm going to point out is open angle glaucoma. This has been correlated with retinal vein occlusion, which is why I brought that up earlier with George's case as well. If someone has open angle glaucoma, they may be at higher risk for an RVO happening. So it's something to take note of. In fact, there was a recent meta-analysis looking to the right now to that lighter blue box. Almost half of RVO cases were attributed to hypertension. About a fifth were attributed to hyperlipidemia. And 5% were attributed to diabetes, although sometimes it can be hard to tease out. And I would bet that diabetes actually probably contributes to a slightly higher percentage than that even. But again, cardiovascular risk factors, something to always keep in mind. I just mentioned to you earlier that if you see somebody who's younger than the age of 50 or 55 and has a retinal vein occlusion, you ought to be thinking about a workup for systemic disease. And there's other indicators that might also trigger a workup like that aside from that third bullet point that says age less than 50. For example, you notice that Dr. Hughes mentioned unilaterality being a more common way to present. Absolutely, but it can happen in both eyes. And especially it can happen in both eyes if there's some sort of systemic root cause of that. So if someone comes in and you find that there's RVOs in both eyes, you got to be thinking about a systemic workup. Additionally, if there's any symptoms or signs of systemic disease, right? If they say, hey, you know what? I had two uh, deep venous thromboses last year. That's something that ought to kind of make you think, gosh, does this person need an additional workup? And even remember things like cancer and occult cancer, occult malignancy in the body can also contribute to hypercoagulability. A recent study found that RVO risk, because in fact, many studies have found this, that over half of patients with CRVO younger than 50 years had non-traditional risk factors, like we talked about, systemic disease, hypercoagulability, or history of hormonal contraceptives on evaluation. And I'll never forget, there was one patient when I was in medical school, a very young lady, 20-some years old, came into the hospital, lost vision in one eye. Uh, she was around 2,400, very much like the case of George that we saw earlier. And they did a complete systemic workup, didn't find anything except that she had been on hormonal contraceptive. So even though that's a rare um, adverse event that can happen as a result of taking these drugs, which are relatively safe, it is something to keep in mind. And I'll always remember that case. Additionally, just to show you one example of a systemic disease, systemic lupus, erythematosus, the incidence of CRVO found in patients with lupus is almost four times higher than in a control population in one recent study. So how do people with RVO present? Well, we talked a lot about this in the case earlier that Dr. Hughes went over, sudden painless unilateral vision loss. Anyone who presents like that, RVO should be on the differential diagnosis. They'll oftentimes describe kind of a fogginess or a complete blurriness in what they're seeing. Sometimes they'll describe a distortion, especially if they have associated macular edema, which we're gonna talk about on the next slide. They may also have an afferent pupillary defect. And just a quick reminder for how to check for that, in the emergency room, we always appreciate any additional information that our emergency medicine colleagues can provide. You take a really bright light like that, that you use for, for the ear, for example, or you can just take a flashlight, a pen light, you shine it in one eye, and then you see if the pupil responds, it should constrict. Then you shine it in the other eye, and the pupil should constrict to the same level. To check for an APD, that's the reactivity. Now you're going to check for an APD. What you're going to do is a swinging flashlight test. You're going to shine in the light into one eye, you're going to quickly shine it to the other eye. You should see constriction every time you switch over and shine it into the eye. If you don't and you see a paradoxical enlargement of the pupil instead, that is what a relative afferent pupillary defect is. And it really has to do with the fact that the optic nerve is has become ischemic as a result of this disease or another disease. So what you're looking here in the pictures at is the uh, example of a fundus of a normal eye. So the fundus just means the retina, but we mean like sort of the central area, the most critical structures, which include the macula, which is that slightly darker region that's sort of hugged in by the by the main arc, major arcades. And then of course that whiter uh, yellowish creamy round area is the optic nerve where all of the retina arteries and veins are emerging from. So that's what a normal fundus looks like. Compare that to what I described earlier as the blood and thunder appearance to the right. Right? You can see that definitely does not look normal. What you're seeing there is a whole bunch of hemorrhages from the, you know, the vein. Basically, I told you the hydrostatic pressure because it's 
backed up. It's clogged up. Basically, all of that blood spills out. You can see that as hemorrhages. You also see those white areas um, just superior and inferior to the, to the foveal center in the macula there. Those are called cotton wool spots. Those are small infarcts of the retinal nerve fiber layer. This is essentially an inflammatory and an ischemic disease at its core. Additionally, one other thing I want to point out is look at the vessels. It's a little subtle here because a lot of them are covered by the hemorrhages, but we describe that as tortuous, meaning that generally there is a little bit of winding of the vessels as they emerge from the optic nerve, but these have become very curly, right? They're, they're very twisty and turny. That's what we call tortuous vessels. And lastly, the optic nerve, you can see a nice clean rim in the fundus of the normal eye, right? You can outline that with a pencil versus in the RVO picture to the right, you sort of lose that border. And that's because of disc swelling. So those are some main findings that you'll see. And you can see that just with the direct ophthalmoscope, especially if you dilate the patient, it makes it especially easy to see that. Um, just remember, have the patient look straight ahead. If it's in a dimmer setting, that will help dilate them naturally. And then you come in from the nose side, from the nasal side to get into that eye. And that's what we're looking for are some of these features. They don't have to have all of them, but oftentimes they'll have many of them. So we talked a little bit already about some of the complications from retinal vein occlusion. You know, retinal vein occlusion itself is an ischemic and inflammatory disease, and it can cause vision loss just from the actual vein occlusion. But there are also several complications that occur oftentimes uh, subsequently to the initial presentation that can uh, eventually rob someone of their vision, even if they may have presented with good vision initially. The leading one is macular edema. Macular edema sounds exactly what it is. It's basically a swelling of the macula. The macula is a central part of the retina. It's the most critical structure because it's responsible for our central vision. And that happens because of damage to the blood vessels, uh, to the parasites, to the endothelia, and they are not able to contain the blood vessel contents inside. And as a result, proteins leak out and then um, by osmotic forces, additional fluid and serum leaks out of those vessels, causing distortion of the shape of the macula and leading to blurry vision or distorted vision. We talked about hemorrhage, we talked about ischemia. There's a couple of other things that can happen in very advanced complications of retinal vein occlusion. And those are those three bullet points on the right in that top row. Those are called proliferative signs of retinal vein occlusion. That's where you have so much ischemia that the body's trying to restore a homeostatic uh, state of, state of um, being. And it ends up growing a lot of abnormal vessels called neovascularization. When you have neovascularization, those vessels are bad. They can bleed, causing a vitreous hemorrhage, where the back of the eye is completely filled with blood. You can get neovascular glaucoma, a special type of glaucoma where the pressure goes really high as a result of these vessels. And you can even get a retinal detachment, a tractional retinal detachment, where these basically form a scaffold and take the whole back layer of the eye off. So really serious things which is why it's so important not only for RVO patients to seek fairly quick treatment, as Dr. Hughes said, 24 to 48, 48 hours with a retina specialist, but also for the retina specialist to also be following these patients, especially through the first year or two. Let's talk about macular edema and some of these other complications briefly. So ma macular edema happens in about 5 to 15% of patients with BRVO over the course of that first year. Oftentimes, they don't have macular edema upon presentation. They could be 20-20. Their vision could be perfect. Maybe sometimes a BRVO is something that some people even incidentally find. But eventually, over time, they can have this, and that can affect their visual acuity. Contrast that to CRVO, which of course I told you affects a larger area, affects all four quadrants of the retina. The majority of those patients actually will have macular edema from presentation, and those patients will need to be treated from the start. Macular ischemia we talked about is a really important component because patients can have really drastically varying degrees of macular ischemia, depending on if they have BRVO or CRVO. And it also really is a good prognostic indicator of what their final visual acuity is gonna be like. Some patients will not end up regaining vision or will not regaining all of their vision. Some patients will. Some patients will improve, and a lot of that has to do with macular ischemia. Additionally, we talked about vitreous hemorrhage, right? We talk, Those percentages um, are, are probably true, but they're comparing different states of uh, time frame. So BRVO patients actually overall have a lower chance of having a vitreous hemorrhage develop compared to CRVO patients. Because CRVO patients have a much more extensive area affected by ischemia, they're much more likely to have some of those proliferative changes that we talked about, but it can happen in either case.
How about some of the imaging that we use these days in ophthalmology? So for example, on the left, that's a fundus photograph and that's capturing all of those hemorrhages across the entire area of the retina. That's what you're seeing there. In the middle is something called an OCT. This has really revolutionized our field. It allows us to see a cut of the macula. This is essentially our form of a CT scan, but it's non, um, there's no radiation involved in scanning these patients. And it can show you at a very, very detailed structural level what's going on with the macula. You can see those areas that are dark represent areas of fluid in the macula. That's macular edema. And finally, to the right is fluorescein angiography, where we inject a dye in a patient's vein, and we see where that dye goes. And you can see, first of all, the tortuous veins, right? They're much more curly, much more twisty and windy than normal vasculature would be. Sometimes we can also use fluorescein angiography to note neovascularization, and that will show up as really bright white areas. Same thing for BRVO, just to point out some subtle differences. You can see here in the fundus photograph on the left, the hemorrhages are only very distinctly along the supratemporal arcade of this patient, right? They're all sort of in that quadrant. They're not anywhere else. Anytime you see that sort of distribution, you know it's going to be likely an RVO. Diabetic retinopathy wouldn't cluster in just one quadrant like that. And that's really highlighted by the fluorescein angiography to the right, which is showing all of those sick vessels that are leaking. That's why it's brighter in those areas because the dye is leaking out of these vessels that have been impacted by inflammation and ischemia. So the differential diagnosis of RVO is long and, and, and complex. We're going to talk it about some of the most common ones with some overlapping features and how you can carefully distinguish between these. So just take a look at this list, and this includes amaurosis fujax, right? Someone losing vision suddenly, it's also painless. It's often also unilateral. Diabetic retinopathy can look like RVO with those hemorrhages and cotton wool spots, but we're going to talk about some ways to distinguish. And the ones I want to focus on on my last couple of slides here for my section before I hand things back to Dr. Hughes are on this image. So CRVO is on the left. This is our focus for today. We already went through the risk factors and sort of some of the findings that we see. But what about the one in the middle, central retinal artery occlusion? It looks a lot different, but it presents very similarly. Painless, often unilateral, vision loss can be around the same level of vision loss as a CRVO. How do you tell the difference? This is really where it's important to, if you can, get even a limited glimpse of the retina. There's not going to be very many hemorrhages, if any, in a CRAO. You're going to see a pale fundus instead. See how white it is? We call that central area a cherry red spot. What that is is just the foveal center where I showed you is usually a little darker. It looks um, more red here because the surrounding retina is all whitened from the ischemia. So you're going to see a very different appearance here. Additionally, the vessels are not twisty and windy. They're not tortuous. In fact, a lot of times they're attenuated because this condition is related to the cardiovascular risk factors, usually like severe hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. CRAO is important to distinguish between CRVO because CRAO becomes an emergent condition. This is something that needs to be sent to the nearest stroke center if you're not a stroke center, because sometimes there are some limited interventions that can be possible for these patients. And finally, to the right, amaurosis fujax can also present in a very similar way. Again, they can have loss of vision that's painless, often affecting one eye. Most commonly, this is due to some sort of ischemia from the carotid arteries or even beyond. These patients also need an immediate stroke workup. So distinguishing CRVO from CRAO and amaurosis fujax very important. And you can take a look at these charts for further details on the slides that you're able to download. Some of the other conditions that sometimes are, are confused with CRVO include the ones that you see here. Now, these are usually same day types of referrals. So they oftentimes can leave your ER, but they need to go see a retina specialist either immediately in the case of a retinal detachment or in the next couple of days in the, in the situation of diabetic retinopathy and wet macular degeneration. But these look a lot different. You know, For example, retinal detachment, there's oftentimes very few hemorrhages or no hemorrhages at all. You'll see the retina actually mobile when you're looking at it through the direct ophthalmos ophthalmoscope. For diabetic retinopathy, you can often tell just by the distribution and the types of hemorrhages that you're seeing. It's not quite a blood and thunder appearance. It can look a lot like RVO, but oftentimes patients may not have a sudden change in visual acuity unless they have something like a vitreous hemorrhage or something more advanced like that. 
And finally, wet macular degeneration, oftentimes they're going to have a history, a long history, oftentimes of dry macular degeneration. This disease only generally affects the very central macula. So the distribution of the findings are very different from retinal vein occlusion. It can have hemorrhage associated with it, but oftentimes you're going to see other deposits like drusen. Um, and the patient, like I said, often knows that they have a history of this disease. And with that, I'm going to hand things back to Dr. Hughes for continuation of this case. Thank you so much. You know, it's November, so I think it's probably good to be thankful for the fact that we have colleagues in other specialties that can educate us on the depth of stuff and the, the knowledge field that sort of stands before us, particularly with this type of clinical etiology. This is one that we find and we go, it's a thing. And then we, you know, get appropriate follow-up, but I think it, it's beneficial to know the depth of stuff that needs to happen for a person like this, because I think one of the main issues for us as an ED physician with this particular pathology is risk identification and risk mitigation, because I think that really is the crux of what the pathology is. So going back to George's case here, we're going to talk about some of his physical exam components. We already had the visual acuity, 2400 in the affected eye, 2200 uh, globally, and the unaffected eye is okay, so we know it's monocular. Patient's blood pressure was a little elevated, 140 on 78. The pupils are equal around and reactive, and there's the balance of the assessment, including an IOP of 18. Uh, so Dr. Wang, you know, of all these vital signs, is there anything particularly concerning besides the acuity? Are there other things we should be looking at to help narrow down the etiology of the vision loss here? No, I don't think so. Uh, Dr. The visual acuity is the one that stands out. An uh, IOP of 18 is normal, uh, but it doesn't rule out anything. So again, important to remember, this doesn't mean looking just at the vitals. It doesn't mean they don't have a corneal abrasion. It doesn't mean they don't have you know, um, open angle glaucoma, which can have a normal pressure associated with it. But definitely the one thing that jumps out is the significant degree of vision loss. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the things here to note, too, is that we are getting the totality of ocular vital signs on every patient who has an ocular complaint. We're checking that pressure. We're checking their acuity because these things matter as you build them up all together to tell the story. So going further into our examination for George, we actually do a general inspection. We do a slit lamp exam fundoscopy. Um, so one of my questions forever, and I'm almost ashamed to admit this, is, you know, how can we get a good fundoscopic exam at the bedside? I was absolutely floored to learn, and I'm ashamed to admit it, that using a smaller aperture in a non-dilated eye gives you a better view, and it has completely changed my practice at the bedside. Do I get the best view every time? Not necessarily, but I see so much more than I had seen before. Dr. Wang, any other pearls on getting a good fundoscopic exam, given how important it is in a pathology like this? First of all, let me just tell you that when we get consults from our emergency medicine colleagues. We always appreciate even an attempt or a quick glance at the retina. So thank you, Dr. Hears, for doing that and for teaching others around you. I know you're involved with education as well, but you're absolutely right. It's a really hard exam. And sometimes, you know, we have a lot of special tools that allow us to help us, including dilating drops, of course, which make it a lot easier than a patient who's not dilated. But still, you're able to get a quick glance. It really can help you narrow that differential. So taking that direct ophthalmoscope like I said, putting them in a dimmer room or even a dark room helps a lot because that will naturally physiologically dilate that pupil, giving yourself a better chance of getting in than if you're under these bright fluorescent lights that we know that our emergency rooms are often filled with. Another thing to do is have the patient look at something so they're not moving around, you're not chasing a target. I like to give them a big E sign, or if they can't see that, just put something a little bit closer to them and tell them to stare straight at that. And then if you come from the nasal side, as I mentioned, that's gonna give you the best look at the optic nerve and the macula. Uh, if you approach them nasally, instead of coming straight on, you wanna approach them just from their nasal side, oftentimes you'll get a better glimpse. Some of my emergency medicine colleagues also feel comfortable using dilating drops, you know, um, as long as they don't have a history of narrow angle glaucoma or any particular allergies, which are very, very rare to dilating drops. If you just put a drop of phenylephrine 2.5% or tropicamide 1%, oftentimes those are also laying around and they in the emergency room, that's going to give you a much better chance as well. And it'll also give us a head start for when the ophthalmologist comes down to consult the patient. Those are such helpful tips and tricks. And honestly, I'm going to take those on to my next shift uh, in a couple of days here. So thank you for that. All right, continuing on with the physical examination here that we're looking at George. 
and I'm just going to advance my slides. There we go. Uh, we do some fluorescein testing and we see those tortuous veins. We do an ocular ultrasound. It's one of my favorite things in the world to do, but we find that there's no evidence of a vitriol hemorrhage or detachment. Retina looks fine. And again, talking about for the eye, uh, or before the eye, for the eye, and beyond the eye, we've done our sidromic testing, we've done a good neurologic exam on this patient. Not only was the history not suggestive of posterior circulation uh, insult, there's no indicate or no evidence of neurologic deficits on our examination. Um, so, Dr. Wang, I think we know what the diagnosis probably is for this patient, but I guess my question to you, I'm sitting in the emergency department, when am I calling you? How soon am I having this patient following up? And how am I assessing what to do next with George? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it would depend on how certain we are that this indeed is the diagnosis. Assuming it is, I think that what you said earlier, 24 to 48 hours is very appropriate. Um, I know that it looks very frightening, but oftentimes, believe it or not, uh, there's not much we can do besides the medical management. One thing you can immediately do, and I think it never hurts to, for the patient to hear this again and again, is to say, you need to follow up with your primary care doctor, even if they don't have a history of cardiovascular risk factors. I can't tell you how many people go and they found out they had a systolic of 150. They found their HbA1c to be nine. And they had no previous diagnosis. So it can be a chance to intervene and truly make a difference in someone's long-term prognosis. I think it's also really important to do things like counsel smoking. You know, they're not going to stop just because you tell them once in the emergency room. But if they hear that from you, Dr. Hughes, and then they can, they're definitely going to hear it from me when they come to my office, they're much more likely to think, gosh, if two doctors have told me this, I, I ought to start thinking about a cessation plan. Moving on in our lecture here, let's talk about the referral and let's talk about continuity of care. And let's talk about it beyond just retinal vein occlusion, because I think it's really important as we sit here understanding that the risk factors are our emergency medicine's main domain of the ability to identify and help mitigate by alignment with care, specifically with the primary care physician, as well as partnership with our ophthalmologic colleagues. Not only is diagnosis of something like this important, but the smoking cessation, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and connecting patients to care is really the main thing that we need to do. So for this pathology specifically, yes, we need the 24 to 48 hour follow-up. We need a treatment goal of managing this edema. We need that prompt referral to a primary care physician. And then we really need to identify the people who are in particular high-risk pools. Just to reiterate what Dr. Wang had said earlier, patients under the age of 50, people who have specific hypercoagulable states, these are folks that we have to focus on because these are the folks that early intervention is going to help mitigate some of those long-term and longitudinal complications that arise from their additional pathology that put them in a position to have this so young or in such a way. So. One of the things that we really need to talk about, and I think we all share this concern, is the barrier of alignment with care. It is not just primary care access points, and I know that we see uh, articles all the time of folks that are stopping taking primary patients. We have challenges with getting alignment with certain subspecialties, and a lot of that is limited just by virtue of capacity. And so I think one of the important considerations for us is know your system. Understand what resources are available to you. Understand whether you have a partnership with an academic facility that has access to ophthalmology in a 24-hour fashion rolling, like our health system is very fortunate to have understand what your pipelines of connection are. And if you don't have connection for these pipelines, these are things to bring to your C-suite to get folks to understand the need. And it is not just ophthalmology. It is primary care specifically, because again, leaning into what this pathology truly illustrates is a need for us to identify and manage risk for the patient. So just to reiterate, 2 million ophthalmologic-related ED encounters per year in the United States, and that's probably an undercount. Almost 75% of those folks are going to need follow-up in an outpatient clinic, except only 25 to like 40% of those people are going to actually get their follow-up aligned. And that's a problem. It's a problem of access. It's a problem of connection to the healthcare system. And we as emergency medicine physicians can really serve a pivotal role in helping to connect folks to this. Making sure that you lobby your C-suite for access points is very important. All right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wang just to talk about some of the treatment options we have in the final few minutes here. And then we're going to be really excited to answer some questions that you all have.
Thanks, Dr. Hughes. Well, as I mentioned earlier at the start of the presentation, we have come such a long, long way in ophthalmology, especially in retina care for our most common diseases. And of course, one of those is retinal vein occlusion. So you heard me mention earlier that in general, the number one point of management for all patients affected by RVO is going to be medical management. But one of the most common complications of RVO is development of macular edema. And for that, we treat macular edema these days with something called anti-VEGF. Anti-VEGF is something that a lot of doctors now are familiar with because a ton of patients are getting these for all sorts of indications. Anti-VEGF agents are injections of medicine, a small amount of medicine into the vitreous cavity. You can see the image here. We're going through the conjunctiva and sclera, the white part of the eye. We're injecting that through about four millimeters posterior to the limbus, and that brings us into the vitreous cavity. That's a very safe area to poke through. The retina doesn't come up that far. There's no, there's not a whole lot of vascular structures. And patients get these for diseases like macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, but for here, they also get them for RVO with macular edema. These are not one-time injections. I think it's important to know that a lot of times if a patient says, well, what, what's going to happen to me? This is something that you might consider telling them they're going to evaluate you, but many patients will eventually need injections. And these injections are going to be um, an indefinite duration, not usually for life in retinal vein occlusion, but there's definitely going to be more than one injection for most patients. There's a lot of different approved agents that we have now as anti-VEGFs. And some of them are ranibizumab and aflibercept. These are part of what we call the first generation anti-VEGF agents. There's also one second generation called the um, furisumab that was just approved for retinal vein occlusion a couple of weeks ago, actually hot off the press. We have another second generation anti-VEGF called high dose of Flibercept, which is four times the strength of our standard of Flibercept that uh, is not yet approved for uh, retinal vein occlusion, but likely will be in the near future. So a growing number of medications to choose from, but fortunately, all of them are ge in general very effective for these patients. There's been many studies, Bravo, Cruz, Copernicus, Galileo, that have looked at ranibizumab and a Flibercept for this treatment that have been able to improve patients by 15 letters or more on on average um, when they come in with macular edema. And that's because they're able to restore the natural anatomy of that macula and get rid of that fluid and swelling. There's even one study I just want to point out. There's actually many of them, but Levo is one of the few that actually compared head-to-head -head all three of our first-generation anti-VEGF agents, which are bevacizumab, which is used off-label. In fact, that was originally used for colon cancer and it still is for many malignancies. Um, and then we have ranibizumab as well as a flibercept. They're very hard words to say, but all of them are very effective. And from the Levo study, we learned that a flibercept uh, and ranibizumab may be slightly better than bevacizumab when it comes to the long-term treatment of CRVO. I can't get into the depths of the study, but suffice to say that there are subtle differences even amongst first-generation anti-VEGF agents, and a flibercept in general is thought to be sort of the longest lasting. And so in a post-hoc analysis from this study, they saw that patients needed fewer injections with a flibercept than patients who are receiving bevacizumab, for example. So just remember to, um, if a patient is not having sort of an optimal response to one, we may switch them to another, even within that quote unquote first generation class. Like I said, only half to um, one half to three quarters of patients will require continuous treatment to control their macular edema for five or more years after starting treatment. So it's important to set expectations correctly for patients, let them know it's not just going to be a one-time treatment, that they're likely going to need um, at least you know, a series of injections, but that these injections have a very good chance of restoring vision, especially if the ischemia is not extensive. And there's different types of approaches to the way we do injections. We won't have time to cover all of those today, but the most common one used is called treat and extend, where we basically treat patients with injections. And each time they come, if they're doing well, we go a little bit longer between that visit and the next visit. So we kind of just kind of ease them out. So if you hear that um, term, that's where it comes from. And I want to just spend one second on uh, intravitreal steroids, which is another class of medicines in addition to anti-VEGFs that we do use to treat macular edema as well. But these are generally considered second-line therapies because there can be some adverse events such as cataract formation or progression or an increase in the intraocular pressure. But these are also very effective. Remember, we talked about 
RVO being both an ischemic disease as well as an inflammatory disease. And the steroids really can help with both aspects of that. And there have been many studies that have shown that. I do use a lot of steroids actually in my patients, and they work very well in combination with anti VEGF. Additionally, for those patients with neovascular presentations or complications, remember I told you that they can get neovascularization where there's abnormal growth of vessels, and that can lead to vitreous hemorrhage, it can lead to tractional retinal detachment. They may be receiving laser in their eyes, something called panretinal photocoagulation, where we basically treat the retina and drive down that VEGF uh, stimulation in the eye. And with that, I'll hand things back to Dr. Hughes to wrap it up. Thank you so much. So George did well. Um, we told George that he had a retinal vein occlusion. We were able to talk to Dr. Wang over the phone. She gave us some really great uh, follow-up components and helped us set George up for success. But beyond that, we were also able to set George up with a primary care physician to ensure that we took care of his hypertension, which clearly needs better control and some additional risk management. Um, I think all of this illustrates some really important things for us as clinical uh, practitioners in the emergency department. And notably, I think what we need to talk about is how this is a common presentation of painless monocular vision loss and how important it is to have a good history and physical exam to underpin being able to take a broad differential diagnosis and narrow it down to something that is actionable. Really important for excuse me, us as the primary risk factors that we need to identify in the particular high risk groups, the young people below the age of 50 to 55, people who are on anticoagulation and that risk factor identification so that we have mitigation and management strategies for the patient when they leave. Prompt identification of the RVO can really improve patient outcomes. Again, identifying this puts us into that 24 to 48 hour follow-up timeframe, but it's key on getting the right diagnosis, which again, leans into the need for a good history and physical exam. And then identifying there are some treatments that while we don't do them in the emergency department are really important for the patient. And they may have questions for us regarding what potential options there are for treatment. So it is always good to have our specialists in our corner coming and educate us on some of the treatments that happen in their world that allow us to better prepare our patients for what comes next. So with that, we are very pleased to take some questions from you. And I know that we have some questions and Dr. Wang, I'm gonna just sort of read some of these out loud. And I think a couple of them are more dedicated to you here. So our first question is, retinal specialists seem to feel that homocysteine is an important cause and we don't even test for that in DVT and PE. And you know, I gotta say, I don't think I have ever tested for this. I've also never been asked to test for it, but is there utility for a test like this in the ED? Is this something that happens outpatient? That's a great question. Thank you for it. Uh, that is something that we've classically been taught. And it's so interesting whenever I am involved with multidisciplinary, uh, you know, o events or programs like this one, Dr. Hughes, it does make me take a step back and think, why do we do that? You know, classically in the ophthalmic literature, there was a high enough percentage of patients where the root cause etiology was thought to be hyperhomocystinemia. And that's why it's become part of our routine list of, of laboratory events. But I'll tell you, I had a patient who tested positive for that. It was a young patient in his 40s with retinal vein occlusion and ended up with, a, with hyperhomocystinemia as a diagnosis. And he, we sent him to a, a hematologist to, to work with, and actually they're just observing him. So it might be something worth revisiting in, in the future. Um, I, again, I think that's when it's really helpful to have sort of multidisciplinary input into things like this, but it is something that ophthalmologists have routinely been taught to do. Uh, and it's not something that needs to be done in the ER that day. It can definitely be something done outpatient through either the primary care specialist or hematologist. Thank you. That's really helpful to know what we need to do immediately for a patient versus what can happen a little later. To that end, a couple of great questions in the chat right now revolving around what I can do in the emergency department for the patient in front of me at that moment. Should I be considering anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy before I send them for the ophthalmologic follow-up? What should I be doing in the ED? That's an absolutely fantastic question. So again, this is assuming that the diagnosis is retinal vein occlusion. There's really not much from an emergency medicine standpoint to do at that point, except for control any systemic issues that might be happening. So for example, if a patient is very, very hypertensive at that moment, getting their blood pressure down is, is key. But also what I mentioned earlier about counseling them about the medical management, smoking cessation, et cetera. Most of the interventions for retinal vein occlusion are gonna actually be medical in general, unless a patient develops macular edema or if they, you know, in general, or if they develop 
develop neovascularization. A lot of times those won't come until down the line and those are not quote unquote emergent. So if a patient comes to us and they have macular edema, you know, as long as we treat them within a few days or a few, even up to a week or so, uh, we consider that standard of care for, for our field. So there's nothing that would need to be injected on the spot. Another confusing question is always, well, is this, should we be treating this like, you know, um, like an artery occlusion, right? Where we, should we give them anticoagulation? Should we give them a shot of Lovenox or something like that? And the answer is no. There's, um, remember, this is a venous system disease, a localized venous system disease, and there's no evidence that any sort of anticoagulation um, is indicated in the absence of any sort of systemic hypercoagulability. That's great. And actually, it was a perfect lead in because we have another question that actually revolves around the CRAO and what can we do for them? So, you know, for me in the emergency department, when I see someone and that is my primary concern, stroke pathology sort of bubbles top of mind. And I want to get that patient to a stroke center and I want to consider anticoagulation. From an ophthalmologic specialist standpoint, what additional things should I be considering or doing in the ED aside from my stroke workup? Yeah, that's a great question. The stroke workup is first and foremost, honestly. There, the reason that CRAO initially has been, or sort of historically has been considered an, an emergent type of presentation is not actually because of the stroke workup, which was actually a, um, a something that uh, was realized and put into sort of our um, algorithm fairly recently within the last 10 years is when we said that, hey, every patient with a CRIO should go to a stroke center. Really initially, it comes from the fact that we thought that maybe TPA could be injected in these patients if the CRIO was noted uh, within three hours of their symptomatology onset. And the thought was that it could potentially reverse or help the visual prognosis eventually. I will say the data has been mixed with that. Very few patients are able to get diagnosed uh, and treated within a three-hour window, unfortunately. That's the reality by the time they drive to the hospital or the ambulance comes, et cetera. Oftentimes, we're already outside of that three-hour window, but that's where it comes from. And so still, stroke workup, I think, is the one that can make the biggest impact um, so that they don't have systemic manifestations of that, uh, which could obviously lead to, in worst-case scenario, death even. There are some other things you'll read about, like a um, ocular massage, where you take your finger and sort of massage the eyeball. A lot of these things, unfortunately, haven't been proven. Hyperbaric oxygen or hyperoxygenation has also been looked at, again, with sort of mixed findings. And so I don't strongly recommend any of these things, although I always say a digital massage is pretty harmless to do, um, placing firm and gentle pressure over the globe itself with the patient's eyes closed is something that some of my emergency medicine colleagues do uh, while the patient's waiting there. Thank you. That was really helpful. You know, and, and as somebody who clearly likes a simplistic approach to something with a lot of knobs and dials. One of our questions in the chat is, how do you use 3D Doppler ultrasound for diagnosis? And admittedly, I'm a simple man when it comes to ultrasound. I love it, but I'm not as familiar with doing something like this advanced thing. So for our more advanced uh, ultrasound practitioners in the audience, any pearls for performing a 3D Doppler ultrasound for patients in the department? Yeah, you know, uh, some of you may be much more talented than me, and I've got to admit, I've heard some of my emergency medicine colleagues refer to 3D Dopplers in the setting of CRVO. You can hear some sludging of the of the venous passage. I think that would be extremely remarkable. Uh, none of us in ophthalmology, I can tell you, use ultrasound in this setting. The only setting we would use ultrasound for in this setting is if someone had a vitreous hemorrhage meaning that the entire vitreous cavity was filled with blood as a result of CRVO or diabetes or whatnot, and we weren't able to get a glimpse of the fundus itself, of the retina itself. And if you can't get a glimpse, you don't know what's going on back there. And that's where we really heavily depend on ultrasound so that we can actually see what's happening in the eye and get a better idea. Is this a retinal detachment? Is this a, you know, what, what's actually happening? So in terms of direct usage for diagnosis, I, I actually do not um, have familiarity with that because we don't use it in our field. Thank you. Some really phenomenal questions from the audience, and that was actually our last one. I think my takeaway from this lecture today is the importance of a good history and physical risk management and mitigation from our end as ED physicians for this particular pathology. And then maybe more importantly than anything else we talked about today, a good working relationship with our colleagues in different specialties to understand what we can do better in the emergency department to set a patient up for success. 
I could set a fracture, I could deliver a baby, but ultimately identifying these pathologies that have like a slow burn, but yet are emergent 24 to 48 hours, what can we do to set them up for success? So I just want to say a genuine thank you to everybody who joined us today. I want to say thank you to Dr. Wang. Your lecture and material was phenomenal. I hope you all have an amazing day and an amazing Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Hughes. It was a pleasure to work with you. I also want to just echo thank you, Peerview, and thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash FHQ 860. This activity is supported by an independent medical education grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, Incorporated. This activity is certified by the American College of Emergency Physicians. This activity is developed in collaboration with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.